and welcome to this episode of Military History Inside Out. Today I speak with Matt Maher, who's written on um, Arcadian fortifications, and that's a um, an area of Greece, an inland area of Greece, and he focuses on the classical and Hellenistic periods of Greece, basically uh, ancient Greece. Thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with Dr. Matthew Mahar, author of The Fortifications of Arcadian City-States in the Classical and Hellenistic Periods. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. So first, tell me, how uh, how did you get into studying and writing on this subject matter? And you can go all the way back, as far back as you'd like. Okay, well, I started, uh, as an undergrad, I started in, uh, in anthropology uh, in the archaeological stream, and I had I think I was in my third year, going into my fourth and final year, um, and I'd been working on archaeology in Ontario, and I'd gone to Greece for my first time, and I kind of fell in love with classical archaeology and wanted to do that. Uh, it was too late to do any kind of combined degree, so after I finished my anthropology degree, I went back for a second undergraduate degree in classics, mm-hmm. and um, the first site I had ever worked on was a site in Greece, uh, in Arcadia, called Stymphalus, and I ended up going to the University of British Columbia for my master's and my PhD, and um, excavations at Stymphalus were run through UBC, and the director became my advisor, and so I worked there off and on in the early 2000s, and I excavated one of the towers and kind of um, thought this was something I wanted to do. I knew the excavations at Stymphalus, the fortifications at Stymphalus had been excavated and published, um, so I didn't think that there was you know, a thesis there, but my advisor, who also uh, had an interest in fortifications, told me that you know, this really hasn't been done in on, in other Arcadian sites, and that's mostly true. I found only a handful of our, uh, sites in Arcadia had been systematically excavated, and uh, unfortunately, most of um, the sites have either never been excavated or haven't been visited in a hundred years. And uh, I realized that you know this was this was a good topic and something that would involve me getting to go to Greece and doing research on the ground, which was uh, something important to me. I didn't want to do a dissertation um, completely in the library. I wanted to go get my hands dirty, and uh, mm-hmm. and that's that's how it uh, was born, I guess. <laughs> so tell me about uh, the book, then. How do, you, how do you lay it out? How do you break out the, the subject matter in the book? So the book is, is based on my dissertation, um, and when I submitted it for publication as a book, um, the main criticism was its layout, actually, and the way my dissertation is written, you know, I provide all the introductory material, um, here's my methodology and my sources and uh, background reading, and then I went through all these uh, Arcadian sites, but I did geographically five big chapters based on, you know, sites in northern Arcadia, southern Western, Eastern, and Central, and then the synthesis at the end. And the reviewers, the anonymous reviewers who re- reviewed my book said, you know, the context context is good, but the layout doesn't work because it's meant to be read from cover to cover. And the truth is that scholars, you know, need um, a reference book. And so I had to revise the book, um, taking out all the meaty middle chapters and turning that into appendix. So now the book, um, it starts off with the introductory stuff, um, laying out my aims and my sources and um, the chronological range of study, um, some other introductory stuff about uh, the different uh, tactical components of the walls. And then I kind of just jump right to the conclusions of what I found. And then the second half of the book is a detailed catalog appendix where every site is presented and all of the um, – the more archaeological information is presented there. So this way researchers can say, hey, if I want to see what's going on at ancient Mantinea, they can just flip to that chapter. If they want to see what's going on larger picture in Arcadia, they can um, they can read the synthesis. Mm-hmm. So how many, um, sorry, I'm sorry if you mentioned this already, okay. how many different um, sites do you look at or do you include? Uh, there's 19 sites mm-hmm. covered in detail. Um, and these were uh, explained in the book. We know from our ancient sources and inscriptions that there were probably upwards of 40 different um, city-states, poles that existed in Arcadia, uh, but I could only cover the ones that, A, were fortified, um, and B, that were securely identified uh, as this site. And so I do have a second appendix where 
Um, I list the other Arcadian cities and why they were excluded from this study. So we either can't find its location on the ground, um, there's no remains of fortifications, or you know the ancient sources tell us it was fortified, but the no nothing remains today. So the, the autopsy, the personal observation, was a big methodological component. So if I couldn't go and see the walls myself, I couldn't really uh, write about it, obviously. So. Mm -hmm. So and what um so what date range does does this cover again? Where it's classical and Hellenistic, but can you give uh, in in term of years? Yeah, so the classical period starts around 480, the end of the Persian Wars, and goes until the death of Alexander the Great uh, in 323. Um, but the earliest fortifications we find in Arcadia uh, date to the uh, late fifth century, so sometime around um, 425, 400 BC. Um, sorry, those are the earliest, and the latest one we have, I think, are the later 3rd century, so the late 200s BC. So it's a, it's a pretty confined area, and this corresponds well with other um, scholarships that show, um, even though many other Greek city-states were fortified in the classical period, and we know that Arcadia had the institution of city-states, they just weren't fortified yet. And uh, a scholar named Fredrickson, he wrote a a good book on archaic fortifications in Greece, and he didn't find any from Arcadia, um, and because they weren't fortified then, so I was, um, it was fortunate that uh, my research, I guess, complemented his and showed that, yep, no, none of these were fortified in the archaic period. It wasn't until the later part of the classical period that they appear. Mm -hmm. How much variation do they show um, from the earlier periods to the later periods that you look at? Um, variation in terms of uh, how they appear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The structure, form. Um, yeah. Um, there is. Uh, I mean, a large chunk of mine seem to date uh, to around the same period, the early fourth century. So sometime between around 400, 375. In that period, there are others on either side, and um, the ones that are earlier. They're different. We see, how should I say this? In Greek fortifications, they respond to the technology of warfare. And as uh, catapults were invented uh, around 399 BC, and then um, new ones came, new stronger ones uh, were invented probably under Philip and the Macedonians uh, in the, the second half of the fourth century, we see that fortifications respond accordingly to these new machines of war. So we find that the earliest ones, um, they were designed to reflect the limited siege technology that existed at the time. Um, so, you know, when there were towers, they weren't, they weren't regularly spaced. They were kind of strategically placed just to guard gates or specifically vulnerable areas. But as time goes on, because these catapults could inflict much greater damage from further distance, and military architects soon realized that they could uh, be advantageously used as a defensive weapon in these towers. As time goes on, we find that um, the walls get bigger and they expand a greater area, and um, the towers become more regularly spaced, so every 20 to 30 meters or so. And um, the masonry itself, like the if you just appear on the ground, that doesn't really change too much. It's more in the tactical components and the use of different tower shapes, the different types of gates. Um, these are the components that we see get a little bit more advanced in time. So some of my um, questions may be beyond the scope of the book or maybe unanswerable, but I'll ask them to just because you know, sure. I don't know what <laughs> information is out there. So first, um, how how would a military engineer at that time know what works? Is it basically, you know, a city gets attacked, others see it fall, and then information, you know, in, the information spreads, hey, we have to change things this way, or how does that that uh, get inspired? That's a good question, and I'm sure, um, you know, people knew, at least in recent history, um, of, you know, past successes and failures in certain um, instances. I think uh, the truth is that most of these sites were occupied for a long time before they were fortified. Mm -hmm. And so the military architects were like, well, this is our house. <laughs> I mean, this is where we live, and this is our site, and this is what's happening in offensive warfare. So we have to adapt what we can to where we live. Mm 
and that's where we see um, architects really uh, something I found in every single site is that they really um, use the natural terrain um, to complement uh, the fortifications and you know if there's a, a very difficult approach to the city it doesn't have to be fortified as, as strongly if it's a very relatively easy access and this is where um, uh, fortifications have to go and um, again r these sites existed for you know probably in many cases maybe centuries before they were actually fortified so roads and arter arteries they already existed so they had to be uh, incorporated with uh, gates it, it all depends upon the natural surrounding topography um, what kind of um, tower or what kind of gate or how high the wall would be um, we know for sure that there were lessons learned um, from past military successes. We know in 385, our, our historical sources tell us that the Spartans laid siege to the city of Mantinea, and the Spartans were never, um, especially at that time, they weren't a, a siege army. Of course, they were more famously known as an infantry army. And what they did uh, to the city of Mantinea was they redirected the nearby river until it just started splashing against the city walls and the city walls were mud brick and when mud brick comes into contact with water they melt and and so the Spartans just re-diverted this river melted these walls and were able to take the city a few years later when the when the um, when the Mantineans returned and rebuilt their city they made the stone foundations higher and they re-diverted this river to kind of go around the city like a medieval moat Mm -hmm. uh, so that this wouldn't happen again. So they definitely learn from their uh, their mistakes for sure. So when you uh, you mentioned you know uh, walls get thicker and larger as time goes on based on the siege weapons. Um, do you have any in any indication why you know what, how, how do they determine the thickness that works? Is it that which is just good enough, or why not just make it as big as you can from the start? You know, is there any evidence on, on that, on why that is? Um, that, I'm not too sure. I mean, none of these walls are cyclopean or the size that we see in the Bronze Age in Mycenae and Tyrans. Um, they, uh, all the, all the, all of the, the fortifications that I studied in this book, they were all mud brick on a stone foundation. So the stone foundation keeps the mud brick off the ground mm -hmm. uh, where, where, you know, setting, uh, sitting water could accumulate. Um, I think it was, and again, trying to determine uh, the height of these walls because none of them survived. We can look at some stone comparanda, ancient Messini. Um, it seems to have been a, a pretty standard size uh, in terms of height, say between seven and nine meters in height and around three to four meters in thickness. And I think the main reason why they just didn't make them thicker um, was it wasn't necessary, and just the economy of it. These are these are small city states. Um, I imagine local, um, the local people would be building uh, building these. Um, so it's a combination of economy, and they just uh, it was all it was all that they needed, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and the foundation itself, um, how? I guess that's just raised stone. What's the composition of the foundation? How is that? So the foundation is stone um, in all in all cases. Sometimes the stone foundation is only about two meters. Sometimes it's as high as four. Usually, at least over the height of a person. And because Arcadia is located in central, kind of landlocked Peloponnese, it's one of the most mountainous regions in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, so in many cases, it seems that the lime uh, the limestone to build these foundations were just quarried right from the site. It's easier. It's cheaper than you know finding another site and transporting it. And um, there's different ways that it could be cut, so different uh, masonry styles. Um, we find only two examples in Arcadia, so polygonal masonry where each block has more than four sides, mm -hmm. and trapezoidal, um, which uh, the parallel, the opposite sides are parallel, so there's four sides. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be some chronological connection to them, but dating walls just on the style of masonry is very tricky. Mm -hmm. And so they would build an inner and an outer face, again, around, you know, if I had to generalize, around three meters in thickness. And then the inside would be filled with uh, mostly earth, uh, broken pottery, rocks, uh, gravel, any kind of 
debris just to make it solid. In some cases, we know that it was stone all the way through. But again, that's a, a very uh, expensive option. And yeah, so once these two inner and outer faces were filled and the surface was uh, flat, um, then they could build uh, the mud bricks uh, on top of that. Mm -hmm. and, the the and the stones were kept in place, what, just by weight? And just by weight. So the, the ancient Greeks, they, and, uh, I know in some of the, the nicer civic buildings, they would use metal clamps. I don't think there's any evidence of using metal clamps. It was just the weight of the fill holding it all together. Um, so the Greeks didn't have cement like the Romans. So it was just uh, dry masonry and just the weight of the, the structure keeping it together. And the size of these blocks, some of them are considerable. Uh, you know, you can imagine... 75 to a meter in length sometimes and you know half that again in width and height so these are big big blocks any information on how they were moved into place um uh, based on what we know from the construction of other buildings i imagine a combination of uh, cranes and um just simple levers mm -hmm. uh taking a big metal like crowbar and kind of just shifting them into place but mostly for the larger ones it would they would probably be pulled close to the site and then attached with a with a wooden crane and lifted into place with a wooden crane and did they have um domesticated animals to help pull this or was it manpower um yes they would have had domesticated animals uh oxen uh things like that um for the I'm sure it would have been a combination because some of these blocks, they're big and heavy, but nothing I imagine three or four people couldn't pull for a short distance. And because some of these are up in very mountain, like I said, very uh, rocky topography, um, sometimes it probably would have been left to people to if large animals couldn't get up these slopes. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine a combination. And what's the, uh, the perimeter, the, the general perimeter length of these walls? So they vary. Um, some so in the book I divide the fortifications into three different types. So we have the Acropolis type, which it just has the highest part of the city fortified. Um, we have the uneven type, which contains um, which incorporates some high ground, but is, are usually the larger types that incorporate the whole lower city. And then we have horizontal types, which there's only one example of, which is built on completely flat ground, and the, the walls encircle the whole city. So some of the larger um, city-states, uh, Mantinea, uh, Stymphalus, their, their fortifications probably, I know, probably between two and four kilometers in length. Um, some of the smaller ones... Um, you know, we're talking a couple hundred meters because they just fortify like a tiny little citadel at the very top, a uh, very last minute place of refuge for the citizens. But again, the ones that incorporate the whole city, the whole lower town, yeah, these these can range uh, kilometers in, in length. I think Mantinea is the largest around between four and five kilometers. And how, how much wealth did it take for a city to even to put up any kind of walls? You know, this is a question I, I, I don't know too much about. Um, I know that walls could go up quickly if necessary. We know that during the uh, Persian Wars that um, um, after the Athens was sacked, um, we know that they rebuilt their wall very quickly using the population of the town, and but they had some existing monuments that they tore down to incorporate into the wall. Um, we hear in our sources, Mantinea, again, is a good example, that after the Spartans were defeated at the Battle of Leuctra in 370, many of their allies had donated money to help rebuild these walls. Um, Arcadia, it's, it's one of these places, and Herodotus kind of tells us a story about the Spartans who went to Delphi to ask if they should attack the Arcadians and the Delphic Oracle says you know you'll find many well-fed acorn eaters to stop you and this unfortunate kind of label as Arcadians as acorn eaters uh, in antiquity and even uh, until the early part of the 20th century kind of stuck and it it showed Arcadia as this backward provincial kind of poor, isolated area. A uh, more recent study, and I hope my book also shows that this wasn't the case, and they developed along similar lines as other Greek city-states. Um, some of these smaller ones, they would never be wealthy, but again, if you're building um, 
out of materials from nearby. If you're cutting stone right from the hill itself, mud brick is relatively cheap. If you have good clay, um, these things could go up. I think you know relatively inexpensively if other if you know if you're not contracting it out, uh, and if it's just the people in the town uh, constructing it. I should mention I just thought of uh, the biggest city and the clue is in its name, Megalopolis. Um, this was an artificial foundation created when the Arcadian League was formed in 370. And this, in terms of length, uh, the walls of this city were almost nine kilometers long. So that's actually the largest one. Hmm. Yeah. Do you find any, have you found markings or any kind of, I guess, quote, graffiti in the foundations that you've uh, looked at? Um, no, I haven't. Um, again, we have to keep in mind that 75% of every site I looked at uh, the ruins are very fragmentary. Um, mm. Complete circuits almost never exist. Um, they're weathered. They've been sitting on the surface for 2,000 years. Mm. Uh, there's nothing like that. Um, we do know uh, mason's marks do exist in other buildings, um, kind of like Ikea instructions where you'd have two blocks and one would have a letter A and one would have a letter A and you know they would go together. Yeah. Uh, but we just see that kind of detail and pre-manufacture for the fortifications. Mm. And yeah. how many... Um or do they have multiple sort of um, layers, sort of uh, different eras? Do you see anything yes, like that? Um, some do. I mean, um, some were always areas of activity. At, at Stymphalus, for example, in the early Christian period, um, because the, the, the fortifications remain the most conspicuous remains on the surface, the early Christians liked to bury their dead near them. So whenever they were excavating the fortifications and the huge tower and next to the towers, you'd always find these graves. Uh, but in terms of military reuse, we know that this happens in the Acropolis in Athens, the Acro-Corinth, um, these very well um, defendable areas continue to be so throughout uh, throughout history. Um, but again, with the fragmentary remains that we have in Arcadia, there's one site called Depea, it's in central Arcadia, and this was the only clear example where you have this nice polygonal stone, definitely ancient Greek masonry, and then on top of it you have these concrete rubble brick um, construction, so something definitely reused in the medieval period, so there you can see it, it's night and day. Um, we don't get that too much um, in the other sites. Mm -hmm. How about, um, you know, I've seen that, uh, you know, this Google Earth technology has helped identify um, sites from, you know, from high above. Have you had any, um, or has there been any success in this field as far as identifying sites that weren't known before? Um, for, in, yes, definitely, uh, especially in places like the Mideast. I used uh, Google Earth extensively for this. Mm -hmm. uh, Google Earth was very helpful because some of these sites are huge. Some of them are overgrown, uh, impossible to get to you know, by yourself uh, in person, and, and dangerous. I always like to take someone with me because in case I got bit by a snake or I twisted an ankle, I'd be stuck on this mountain. Mm -hmm. um, but Google Earth was very helpful, especially because it has measuring tools, so you're able to lay out the whole trace. In a couple cases, uh, one comes to mind, the site of um, uh, Thysoa. There's two Thysoas, but this one is in central Greece. And the first time I went to it, I couldn't find the site anywhere. And the only people who had visited there, there were some German travelers in the 1800s, and there was a tiny bit of archaeological work done, I think, in the 1940s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find the site, and I ended up having to scan this early German plan and superimpose it onto Google Earth uh, and make it fit roughly in the area where I was looking, and then I was able to go back and, and find it. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, and kind of a, a tangent from this research, um, so this book focuses on the city-states of these urban areas, these, these city-states, mm -hmm. and I've been looking into research uh, in, the, in, the, in the countryside, so rural defenses, and... Um, I was looking at the site of Mantinea because we knew from our uh, from modern archaeological work that there were four or five of these signal towers in the uh, in the countryside, and I thought, well, that's great, but there were all these holes in this network. And I used Google Earth, and a colleague of mine uh, and myself, we we actually discovered two new 
signal towers just using Google Earth that had never been found before. Mm -hmm. And we were able to go back to Greece and, and find them on the ground. And um, this uh, article just came out in, uh, in Hesperia uh, last month, and mm -hmm. it's available. But Google Earth as a prospection tool is very, very useful. It's very, it's, it's popular nowadays for sure. So that um, brings, so I was going to ask another question, which is considering the technology and how much research has been done what are the odds of finding new new locations that uh, have not been known about before? I think it's, 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 especially in Arcadia, there's dozens and dozens of sites whose names we know from ancient sources but have never been discovered. I think a combination of you know what what's being done with drones and in Greece is very dry so parch marks uh, show remains all the time kind of what happened in in the UK this summer um, satellites and and just pedestrian reconnaissance archaeological survey um, I think there's uh, a great chance for this um, for these sites to be known colleagues of mine are working on this eastern uh, or western Corinth uh, um, survey project and they find uh, dozens of sites that have never been known small big you know hamlets to villages and cities and um, all of this can be found just by doing the legwork literally getting on the ground and, and looking for these pieces of pottery and standing remains so i think there's a great chance uh, for lots of these uh, settlements to come come to light it just it's just going to take work <laughs> mm -hmm. So for something like these foundations, um, are they just standing out in the open or would they be under any kind of layer of soil or what might be covering them up, if anything? It's a bit of both. It depends on the vegetation. Um, some are exposed. Um, I, I, I worked on the Sikion uh, Urban Survey Project for five years and you would find um, sometimes whole city blocks, like curbstones running 100 kilometers. Sometimes you find wells. Um, sometimes you just find one little block, but then uh, the magno, the the geophysics would find remains under the surface. Uh, it all depends. Unfortunately, with a lot of remains, and this is certainly true with the fortifications, um, they have the remains have been robbed out in antiquity mm. because it's always easier to find a nice cut block and move it than to make your own. Right. And um, so that's always, especially at these sites where there's villages nearby. Uh, that's uh, definitely a, a common occurrence. Uh, but yeah, these remains, they could be anything. And um, again, at the Sikion survey, we found pieces of a, what looked like a Roman bath, nice brick and concrete uh, kind of core standing, I don't know, two to three meters in height. And it was just hidden in, a, in an apricot grove. So these things exist. It's just trying to find them, you know. Mm -hmm. So... At these sites, what other um, archaeological evidence do you find that gives you an idea of how um, how the fortifications might have been used or how how um, battles might have been fought? Um, none, really. Um, the, 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 the permits I was given um, by the Greek Archaeological Service was limited to the walls themselves and in some cases not at all. Um, and so for those cases, you know, I was still able to go visit these sites. I wasn't able to take measurements or anything like that, let alone, you know, wander throughout the whole remains. So I was limited mostly to following the trace of the wall and then using plans and satellite imagery to kind of show the extent of the city, but I couldn't walk inside um, inside the, the, the fortified area, mm -hmm. um, not only because of the uh, vegetation and in many of these places are very thickly overgrown, um, but most of them are privately owned and it would just be me being out there without permission in some, in some person's field. Um, so we don't find any remains of that. But again, in terms of some of these sites, we do know were sites of ancient battles. Um, we're able to I guess reconcile the topography and some of the remains with uh, what we know about uh, some of these attacks. But again, my my research was limited almost exclusively to the walls themselves. So, is there any technology available or that's being developed that could? Um, you mentioned sort of the fill, you know, the stuff that was used to fill uh, the mm -hmm. foundations. Um, I know people wouldn't want to, you know, take those apart. Mm -hmm. um, necessarily, is there anything that can image in there and give an idea more of what the fill is and what objects might have been dropped in there? 
Um, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think uh, that kind of penetrating technology exists that would elicit that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience, excavating inside a wall isn't too um, much of a ethical concern, I guess, because it's something that can just be filled back in. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that kind of thing is, is certainly important because that's what help us date these walls. So, you know, the latest piece of pottery or coin, the latest date that these tell us, give us a good um, latest possible date for these walls. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent, in the time between my dissertation and, and the book, only one of my sites, or one of the sites I covered had been excavated, um, the site called Phenios, and the excavators um, actually used a part of my dissertation because I had said, you know, I thought that this was a tower, and they had thought, gone and excavated it, and it proved that, uh, you know, what I thought was a tower was just a kind of square building attached to the wall on the outside. But they were able to find a coin, uh, a Sikion coin, that uh, right in the foundation of, of the of the walls, which would uh, which provided them a late uh, fourth century date for the walls. So, yeah, finding the the fill. Excavating the fill inside is useful, but again, they can um, just by digging the foundations on the outside. Sometimes you're rewarded with um, with this kind of evidence, this kind of dating evidence. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, the resources you used for your research. Obviously, you know you looked at the sites. Tell me what else you used to um, to do this research. So I, I had a fellowship in Athens. I stayed at the, the Canadian Institute, and uh, they were great. Um, but I did most of my research at the, the British School because their library was a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And it basically, I guess my resources were, were two points, parts, like you said, on the ground, and the rest was in the library. And uh, beginning, I looked at all the, the modern scholarship on Arcadia, um, Jost and Roy and um, Nielsen and these are people who have you know studied Arcadia for decades and they were really the starting point for me because these are I'm an archaeologist but these are proper historians and they were able to you know met, list all these places in Arcadia that gave me a good starting point um, unfortunately the or I guess fortunately for me there wasn't too much written on individual sites as I said some of these had been excavated very quickly by the Greek Archaeological Service in the early 20th century, but a great many of these sites had never been excavated, and I was relying on early modern travel accounts. So um, in the early 1800s, well, in the 19th century, really, we see a lot of British and um, German scholars kind of traveling around Greece. As Greece won its independence and kind of opened up again to the West, these guys traveled around the country and they described the ruins. And um, this was extremely useful for me because they, in many cases, described things that um, didn't don't exist today. And um, so that was a huge part of my data collection because, you know, they measured walls. They recorded the masonry in certain parts that, again, have since uh, been torn down or been lost. And so it's a very important resource, resource one not, not used enough, I don't think. And um, much of it was very insightful. And so... You know, I would do all this research. I would look through the primary sources, what our ancients, uh, what the ancient historians said about them, what um, modern scholars said about them, what these travelers said about it. Try to get all the information I could, and then I would go visit the site. Uh, and I, I created all these different forms for measurements uh, when I was allowed to take measurements. When I wasn't, this is where I used uh, Google Earth and that kind of uh, technology to make measurements. And the data collection part was, uh, in many ways, the most important because, you know, I could, it, one might argue you could do all this from Google Earth, but you really have to be there to see how the fortifications really interact with the natural topography and how they, they complement and how they, they, work, they work together. So, um, so that's, that's how I spent a year in Athens, uh, weekdays in the British Library reading all this stuff and then uh, weekends renting a car and driving down to the Peloponnese and, and and finding these sites and walking the walls and taking pictures and taking measurements and then coming back and trying to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Nice. Sounds like a, a fun time. It really was. And I had some good friends in Athens. Again, I, 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 I tried not to go by myself because I didn't think it was completely safe. Mm -hmm. And so I usually had a, a colleague or two who just wanted to get out of the city and they were extremely helpful uh, in this as well. So uh, that leads to my next question, which part of this research was most enjoyable? 
you know what? It was a combination of reading these 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 um, these early modern travel writers, and it, it is like reading a time machine. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the ancient Greek writer Pausanias, but in the around AD 150, AD 175, he traveled around Greece just describing everything he saw. And some cities were still flourishing, some were in decline. Um, but his 10 books, they survive complete. And it's mm. just like reading a guidebook, you know, from the early, um, early second century. And many of these early modern travel writers were following in Pausanias' footsteps. And um, just reading, uh, reading some of their accounts was, was fascinating. And, and some of the ethno- ethnographic stuff and because they would go into the villages and talk to people, and that that was really interesting as well. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that part. But I think ultimately, yeah, getting on the ground and walking these sites, feeling like in some cases, you know, you're the first person to have done this in a century, um, was uh, was was definitely rewarding and and definitely it was definitely fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and that's important. I've had um, I tell my students now who want to go into grad school. One of the, the best pieces of advice I can give them is, you know, when it comes to your dissertation, you have to do something you enjoy because you're not going to get through five or six years of this if you don't enjoy it. And I certainly wasn't a problem for me. I, I loved every second of it. What kind of uh, vegetation did you encounter around the sites, and would it have been similar to what it would have been back when these were used? Uh, we found a bit of everything. Um, so you find um, olive orchards, uh, fruit orchards. Um, sometimes there's wheat fields. Um, what we encountered most was this, it's called holly oak or maki. And it is horrible, horrible stuff. It is so dense. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just like, like, like holly as you imagine it. It is just sharp, mm-hmm. and scratchy. And sometimes there's little paths, but they're usually just made by goats, so they don't extend all the way up to a standing human. Mm-hmm. And you have to go, you always have to wear long sleeve and pants, no matter the time, whether it's in 40 degree heat in August, and you have to go through these paths and try and uh, make sense of it. And you can't make your own path because this stuff is so thick. Um, because goats will eat this stuff, um, we find it in much of the high ground, much of the places where people can't cultivate other um, other products. And so the, the hilltops where the majority of the time I spent, it's just covered in this stuff. Uh, yeah, so that part was less enjoyable. but uh, And I imagine it would have been similar in antiquity. This stuff certainly would have existed on the slopes, inside the walls. I doubt, uh, it, you know, in the livable area, we wouldn't have seen this. Uh, but on the inaccessible parts, the parts of the sites that are only good for grazing, I think this would have been um, uh, definitely something in antiquity. And and it's something, it's a question I always had, and I, and I still don't have a satisfactory answer about whether the ancient Greeks would leave this thick, impenetrable vegetation surrounding the outside of the, the, their walls, mm-hmm. like on these slopes, as an extra deterrent, uh, you know, to anyone trying to lay siege to the city. Uh, the counter-argument, of course, would be that the enemy could just set it on fire. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I don't know. I, I could see both sides why it, would be, why it would be useful and why it wouldn't. But, yes, if you ever go to Greece or anywhere in the Mediterranean, this, this maquis is, uh, is not pleasant. <laughs> mm. It's very woody. It, it's... It's very woody. It's very. The leaves are, are just razor blades on every side, mm. and um, yeah. And then giant Greek spiders um, like to um, extend their webs across any paths. So you, you know you're walking with one hand in front of your face to block the spiders, and mm. you're watching for your eyeballs. And yeah, <laughs> still still fun, but uh, always an adventure. Um, but yeah. Is there a lot of grass around there too, or is it um, taken up by this this? stuff this maquis this maquis this stuff grows everywhere like out of rocks everywhere so there's some grass um um but it's usually in the low-lying areas uh and and depending on the time of year but on the hilly areas definitely it's mostly it's mostly this stuff this stuff is ubiquitous it's it's everywhere mm-hmm. punaria i think the, the greeks call it but it's yeah hmm. so what did you find uh that was most surprising during your research? 
Um, well, two things. You know, I, I, I try not to have any kind of preconceived notions, obviously, and how the, the methodology I worked on, and this is pretty common practice in archaeology, is, is using datable comparanda. And so the site of Stymphalus um, had been excavated, and it was found to date to sometime between, you know, 400 and 375, sometime in the first quarter, first third of the fourth century. Um, Matinea, we know historically, dates to around 370. This is the time when, um, again, Sparta stopped, lost their hegemony in the Peloponnese, and the Matineans rebuilt this. We know Megalopolis also dates to this time. And there were one or two other sites that had been excavated that gave us dates. And so the vast majority of sites that didn't have dates, I could only say, you know, the masonry here, the layout or the tower or the spacing, this is similar to this site or this is similar to this site where we have a date. And so that kind of, um, that's how you date things that haven't been excavated. And one of the biggest um, surprises, I guess, was, you know, as I was writing up my final chapter in the synthesis and uh, as I went, you know, I, I said, okay, this site has this site, this site has this date, this site has this date, but I never really thought about what it meant in the big picture and I think the biggest surprise I found was how many of these sites dated to the early 4th century again right at this time when Sparta had lost its control its hegemony over these these Arcadian states in the Peloponnese and, uh, and I was trying to make sense of why you know why this, this, this pattern uh, emerged and then when I looked at the location of these sites and uh, uh, these are all strategically important sites, and again, dating to this time. So I, um, it seemed clear to me that it was a result of the formation of the Arcadian League. So again, after the Battle of Leuctra, when the Thebans defeated the Spartans, the Spartans weren't really a threat anymore. And so the Arcadians came together and they formed a, confederance, a confederacy, a, an Arcadian League, and they built Megalopolis as its center. Um, a lot of people from different cities went there to fill this huge city. But other sites became fortified at this time, and I, it seemed clear to me that um, the impetus for this boom in fortification construction was the creation of this Arcadian League and the loss of uh, the Spartan hegemony in the in the Peloponnese. It seemed uh, it seemed too too clear to be not the case. Uh, the other main surprise I found was the role that water. Um, the role that water played in the defenses of these cities. If uh, again, I lived in Athens so for a year, so I visited these sites throughout the year. And when you visit in the hot, hot, dry summer months, um, there's no trace of water. Like you go to Stymphalia, it has a kind of marshy lake that stays there all year round, but the rest of these sites are are so dry. And this is why uh, forest fires are such a problem in Greece. But it wasn't until you revisit these sites. Uh, in the winter and you see some of these little streams or when you look at the satellite technology or the satellite imagery and you see these water courses, it became clear right away that every single site uh, without exception um, protected um, at least one, in almost every case, two sides of their city with either a river or a lake, some kind of, of water source. Uh, again, the analogy is kind of like a moat. It's just one more outwork that... Uh, uh, an enemy would have to to cross before getting, and this was surprising, as I said, because when you visit in the dry months, you don't see any trace of water. Uh, it's only after further digging that you that you see that this was the case. Do you um and, and to use a, a modern military term, did you see any, as far as the location of these sites, any defense in depth? Me meaning, um, did it seem as though uh, the the sites reinforced? each other's defense and that if you had to go through one to get to the other and um yeah that's my first question um do you mean like um outworks on a single fortification or do you mean like how one city would protect another city one protecting another like you know if an invader were coming through would they have to use certain paths and you know oh. you, you know and encounter city upon city as they try to invade uh, yes, <laughs> in um, in this one kind of north-south running corridor uh, along the eastern edge of Arcadia, uh, one of the most common um, kind of routes linking linking uh, Laconia, Sparta in the south to 
like Corinth or Argos or the the coast in the north. Mm-hmm. This uh, it runs through um, the site of Tegea and Mantinea, and then Alea or Kamenos, and then Stymphalia or Stymphalus. And so it's this corridor. And in many of these cases, Alea is a good example. Another site called Asea, there, and, and Stymphalus is probably the best example. Is they built these cities in a way that would force people to pass close to them. Hmm. Um, Stymphalus is the best example, I think, because we know that it was actually a, a new foundation. So the archaic period, the Stymphalus mentioned by Homer, was somewhere else in the valley, but sometime right around the time they were fortified, around 400, 375, or, or a bit later, they moved the city and they refortified it, and they built it right next to a lake. And the only way to get through this valley um, was a tiny little gap between a mountain and what would have been the city walls, so only a couple hundred meters. Mm-hmm. And so the lake and the city kind of formed a natural bottleneck that, uh, or not natural because the city was built, but uh, a bottleneck that would funnel traffic as close to the city as possible. And the next city stayed over, the site of uh, Alea. They did a very similar thing because of seasonal kind of swampy areas that take over part of the plain and where the main road was, they built their city in a way that stuck out into the plain that would force anyone coming uh, through the city would have to travel probably within firing distance of the, the catapults in their in their towers. Mm-hmm. It would also force um, people to pay taxes or a, a toll if they, uh, if they did that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, and I asked the question because it seems that, you know, not that there's necessarily any evidence of this, but um, you know, um, residents of one city might be willing to help build the wall of another city if, if it all served to protect the whole community. Um, um, that's just the idea I can't, you know, that, that popped yeah. into mind. No, I agree. And I think that, and I've written about this before, about especially the sites of Stymphalus, Mantinea, and Alea, um, right at this time when the Arcadian League was forming and they... I think that they definitely work together. I think their walls were built at the same time, uh, probably using the same people. There's so many similarities in the date, in the style, the layout. Uh, and on either side, to the east and west of these three city states, uh, were the city of Orkamenos from Arcadia and another site called Phleas. And these were two cities who were enemies against the Arcadian League, and they were allies of Sparta. Mm-hmm. And um, their territories joined... Uh, uh, all three of these territories to the east and west. So we have this nice north-south corridor, and I think that that is definitely the case. And we know from our written sources that other allies would donate men and money uh, to help build the fortification in the in the in the issue in uh, in the interest of greater safety. Mm-hmm. Did they have a single ruler over them, or it sounds like there it, it was um, these various groups, conf- you know, like a confederation? Yeah. The, well. I mean, this, the Greek city-state is pretty autonomous uh, in itself. They have their own institutions and their own laws and their own system of government. And um, when they came together in the Arcadian League, um, certainly, you know, larger members, uh, Matinea, Tegea, they probably would have had uh, more sway. Uh, but they were all working in the collective interest. But there wasn't a single, in this time period, until, you know, the Macedonians kind of, enter the picture and start imposing different types of rule. There was, there was none of that. They would have been these communities kind of ruling themselves coming together for the greater defensive interest. Mm-hmm. And would the, uh, do you know if the rural areas that you're looking into, would they, they have fallen under the control of the nearest city state or what, what sort of gov- governance would they have had or been part of? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the understanding. Um, we have, uh, what are called dependent poles, uh, and um, this isn't something I discovered, but this is something I used in my research. But there are um, city-states, independent city-states as we would understand them, but they were dependent. They were kind of linked to larger ones. And one of the sites I looked at, Nestani, um, it was in this small plain, and it was just a fortified Acropolis, and they would have had a settlement. And they were a, a city-state as we understand it, but they were also a dependent of Mantinea, much larger. And our sources tell us of others so who sometimes – just in the interests of presumably safety and economy, uh, some of these city states, you know, became members or, like I said, dependent members of these larger these larger city state entities. Mm-hmm. So we know that that definitely happened. And what was the uh, sort of the formal way in which that was um, 
determine were there, you know, documents or do we have anything like that that shows how, how that was I done? I don't know how about the formal process. I imagine it would have to be agreed upon by, you know, the, the, the citizenry of the people who want to join the other one. They would have to agree. Um, I know inscriptions exist. Um, one of these sites called Helison, um, it's in central Arcadia. They decided to become a dependency of Mantinea, so they, their territory kind of becomes Mantinean territory. How the actual decision is made, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So what's the most difficult part to research? And, and certainly there are a lot of unanswered questions, but uh, was there anything in particular that you thought you could um, find an answer to and was just particularly difficult to, um, to research? Trying to avoid circular arguments was tricky, um, especially when it came to trying to date um, date some of these remains. And um, that the dating, trying to date these things, the, these sites that were, the walls of these sites that weren't excavated, uh, was certainly the trickiest part. And in um, that site I mentioned, uh, Phineas, that had been excavated since I had first written about it. Um, so I had, ba I had said, okay, based on its stylistic similarities to what we see at Stymphalus nearby, what we see at this site, what we see at this site, I said the wall should date to uh, around 375 to 350. And as I mentioned, the excavators recently found this coin. They were able to date it. And it looks like it's about 25 years in the other direction. So about 350 to 325, um, which is great. You know, they got a date. I'm not upset that you know my date wasn't right again everything i did in terms of date is, is speculative it says that in the book mm -hmm. and you know in the next hundred years every one of these sites could be excavated and every one of these dates could be wrong but you know until someone gets started on the process and puts out their best educated um conclusions then um then nothing's ever going to change so mm -hmm. um I, I i hope that this will you know, other scholars will use this like the people at Fenios did and answer questions that either confirm it or, or don't as long as we, we get these answers. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I, I think trying to find the dates for these things was the, was the trickiest part. Yeah, it's like a continual discussion. Yes, yes. Um, was there anything you discovered that emotionally moved you in some way, either positively or negatively? And that can be any aspect of the research, um, maybe not necessarily the material itself, but anything you encountered. You know, the sites themselves, I will say, just being out there, every single one was different, but every single one was moving. Um, besides actually finishing this <laughs> this book mm -hmm. that was emotional, but being out there on the ground, being in the middle of nowhere, um literally, you know, on the top of a mountain and, you know, this landscape of uh, Arcadia. I mean, Arcadia moved me every time and I still love it and I still try to go every summer. Uh, but this as, as a place, it's very easy to see why Arcadia became a, the synonym for this pastoral, beautiful utopia, like in later Roman poetry. And um, it, it, it's still moving today. And when you go to these sites and... It's perfectly quiet. You can hear a dog bark five miles away. It's very easy to imagine that the landscape looked exactly the same 2,500 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, except for maybe a telephone line or the plane flying over. Mm -hmm. um, if you can imagine, if you can reconstruct the city in your mind, like the complete surroundings wouldn't have changed at all. So you know, every time you go, it feels like you're uh, going into a time machine, and that's something that is not lost on me ever. And it's always, it always still moves me when I, when I go there today. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. What do you hope? Um, well, what, when was this book published? It's, it's been out for a little while. Uh, a year, a year ago this October. So a year ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did you hope the book would do for, for this field of, of research? And do you feel like it's, it's having the effect, uh, you wanted? I think it's a little too early to tell. I mean, I, I've only even seen one review come out so far, but my hope is um, that people will use it to kind of further what I thought was important, and that is um, two things, getting out of the library and seeing these things yourselves. Um, much of the fortification literature that exists is 
you know, and, and this isn't a criticism because if someone's trying to write a book on Greek fortifications from Spain to Turkey, they're not going to be able to visit every site. Um, but I would hope it encourages people um, to show them the importance of autopsy, of, of getting on the ground and seeing this stuff in person. And the other thing is is to look at fortifications in a regional way. Um, I think before this, there was only two other studies um, where they looked at fortifications as a region, uh, one in the early 2000s up in, in Focus in kind of north central Greece and one in Crete um, more recently, a few years before this. And I think that's where we're going to find these answers and looking at these um, these cities in a single region as, as, uh, as the best comparative for each other. So, you know, trying to compare some of these small sites that I looked at to Athens doesn't really make a lot of sense, I don't think. You know, comparing it to, to another site that just because it's famous or just because it's well-preserved isn't going to give us the answers we need. And these sites, uh, because... Um, because they represent the average Greek city-state is why I think they're important. And so I would hope that in the future when people look at Greek fortifications, they will do it in a, in a regional way. And there's lots of areas left of Greece where people can do this. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I think that would be very uh, fruitful. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book uh, finished or published and how you overcame those? You know, the book, it was actually, uh, you know, pretty smooth sailing. Um, it's the only book I have. I've had articles um, published that were more, that took longer and that were that were more difficult. Um, so I decided to, you know, to submit it to Oxford. Uh, they had done that, that one on archaic walls I mentioned. I thought it would be a good fit and their reputation is stellar. So I wrote a proposal and... Um, there are two reviewers. Uh, as I said, one was completely positive. The other one was very positive and just mentioned the restructuring. Um, and so once that was laid out, I took my dissertation. I had to restructure it, but I also had to cut 200 pages. And so that was the, definitely the hardest part. So my dissertation is about 600 pages. And uh, the book is, is, I think, 400 exactly. And once that was out, I mean, once I edited it down, that definitely took the most time. And the proofreaders were amazing. The editors were amazing. The um, what I thought would be very difficult would be getting copyright permission. So ninety ninety five percent of the images in this book are my own, um, either Google Maps or um, my own photos from visiting every site. But there were a few plans that I needed to get copyright to use, and um, I was very stressful about this. You know, approaching these these great scholars and just saying, hey, can I use your map in my book? And um, my editors were saying, well, we need to know, we need to know. And I remember finding email addresses for these people. I had met a couple before and sending them emails. And one after another, right away, they, were abs they, were, they said, no problem, no problem, absolutely, no problem. Some of them said, you know, we have to pay hundreds of dollars to see an image from the British Museum, so I would gladly give you my stuff for free. And um, So what I thought was going to be the trickiest part, this, this academic courtesy was, was unbelievable. And once that was done, um, and uh, again, they did all the work, they did all the typesetting, and they just sent me proofs to read, and having to reread it a few times was a bit trying. Um, <laughs> you know, you kind of live with this thing for years and years, you kind of get sick of reading your own, hearing your own voice in your head when you read, but uh, the book process was 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 painless. Uh, I know that's not the case in every situation, but uh, it, was, it was absolutely great for me. So what's, so this has been out uh, a year, um, What what did you start what have you started working on, your next writing project, or have you? Um, I haven't yet. I, uh, Like I said, I've been working on other things, and uh, that, that um, rural fortification um, in Mantinea, I've been working on that for a long time, and that was a lot of back and forth. And uh, But that just came out last month, so that's done. Um, I do also work on some excavations, so we've been working on some very different from this, but I've been looking at some Roman pottery for a couple of sites that I've worked on. So those publications should be coming out. But uh, I would like to, um, in many ways, I feel like I've mined everything I could out of this. I mean, there was one footnote in this book that I turned into an article just on a footnote. And I feel like I've kind of milked this <laughs> for all the information I can get. Mm -hmm. And so I think I would like to uh, change directions. I'm really interested in this
use of, uh, as we touched on, this use of Google Earth for archaeological prospection, especially in terms of looking for uh, these rural defenses in Arcadia, these signal towers, and uh, what I did for Mantinea, I would like to do for, for other city-states in the area. I think it would complement uh, my work, um, but be completely different as well. Mm -hmm. So where can people find um, the book and also uh, your writings online if you do social media or website or anything? Um, I'm on academia.edu. The book can be found uh, Amazon, I ima uh, and I imagine, uh, I know it's in about 100 libraries across the world. Um, uh, I have Twitter, Dr. Matt Mahar. Um, can you spell that? Uh, D-R-M-A-T-T-M-A-H-E-R. -T -T -E okay. Um, in this, uh, and in the book, and on academia.edu, uh, .edu, you can find uh, links to other publications ranging from, like I said, from Roman pottery to uh, stuff from the book to commentaries on early, these early, um, the value of these early travel writers I had mentioned. Um, yeah, so the stuff's out there, and in, in, in the bibliography of the book, you find references to all these things. This newest article that just came out, it's uh, from Hesperia. It's uh, the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. It's their journal, and that's available on JSTOR. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Uh, I don't. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's uh, never done anything like this before, but it was very enjoyable. Okay, good. Well, thank you for speaking with me. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C R I S. On Facebook under War Scholar. On YouTube under War Scholar 1945. And on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.